Welcome back to the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm Beckett, and today we're going to be meditating on the readings for Saturday of the second week of Lent. Normally, I enjoy reading to you excerpts from sermons by the Church Fathers. Today, however, we're going to be doing something a little different. I'm going to read to you an excerpt, a larger excerpt, from a homily by my spiritual father, and I'm sure a spiritual father to many of you, Pope St. John Paul II. And this homily comes from September 8th, 1999, and it's specifically geared toward the parable of the prodigal son, or is it sometimes called the parable of the forgiving father. So let's just jump right into it and to see what Pope St. John Paul II says about today's gospel reading specifically. In the New Testament, God His forgiveness is revealed through Jesus' words and deeds. In pardoning sins, Jesus shows the face of God, the merciful Father. By opposing certain religious tendencies marked by hypocritical severity towards sinners, he shows on various occasions how great and profound is the Father's mercy toward all his children. The high point of this revelation can be considered the sublime parable which is usually called the prodigal son, but which should be called the merciful father. Here God's attitude is presented in terms that are truly overwhelming in comparison with human criteria and expectations. The father's conduct in the parable can be understood in all its originality if we keep in mind that in the social context of Jesus' time, it was normal for sons to work in their father's house, like the two sons of the vineyard owner, whom, uh, seeks, uh, whom, uh, of whom he speaks in another parable. This system continued until the father's death, and only then did the son divide the property that they had inherited. In our case, instead, the father agrees to give the younger son his share of the inheritance and divides his possessions between him and his elder brother. The younger son's decision to be emancipated, squandering the goods he had received from his father and living a dissolute life, is a shameless dejection, excuse me, a shameless rejection of family communion. Leaving the father's house clearly expresses the meaning of sin as an act of ungrateful rebellion with its humanly painful consequences. Human reasonableness in some way expressed in the elder brother's protest would have recommended an appropriately severe punishment for the younger son's decision before he could fully rejoin the family. But the father, catching sight of him while still a long way off, runs to meet him full of compassion. Or better, inwardly moved with pity, as the Greek text literally says. He embraces him lovingly and wants everyone to celebrate with him. The father's mercy is even more apparent when he tenderly reprimands the elder brother for demanding his own rights and invites him to the communal banquet of joy. Mere legalism is surpassed by the Father's generous and gratuitous love, which exceeds human justice and calls both brothers to be seated again at the Father's table. Forgiveness consists not only in taking back under the paternal roof the son who has left, but also in welcoming him with the joy of restored communion, bringing him from death to life. This is why it was fitting to make merry and be glad. The merciful father who embraces the prodigal son is the definitive icon of God revealed by Christ. First and foremost, he is father. It is God the father who extends his arms in blessing and forgiveness, always waiting, never forcing any of his children. His hands support, clasp, give strength, and at the same time, comfort, console, and caress. They are the hands of both a father and a mother. 
the merciful father in the parable possesses and transcends all the traits of fatherhood and motherhood. In throwing himself on the son's neck, he resembles a mother who caresses her son and surrounds him with her warmth. In the light of this revelation of the face and heart of God the Father, we can understand Jesus' saying so disconcerting to human logic. Quote, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who have no need of repentance, end quote. And, another quote, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents, end quote. The mystery of coming home wonderfully expresses the encounter between the Father and humanity, be- between mercy and and mercy between excuse me between mercy and misery in a circle of love that touches not only the son who was lost but is extended to all the invitation to the banquet which the father extends to the elder son implies the father's exhortation to all the members of the human family to be merciful as well The experience of God's fatherhood implies the acceptance of brotherhood, precisely because God is the father of all, even of our erring brother. In recounting this parable, Jesus does not only speak of the father, but also lets us glimpse his own sentiments. To the Pharisees and scribes who accuse him of Receiving sinners and eating with them, he shows his preference for the sinners and eating with them. He shows his preference for sinners and tax collectors who were reproaching him with trust. He thus reveals that he has been sent to manifest the Father's mercy. This is the mercy that shines brightly, especially on Golgotha, in the sacrifice offered by Christ for the forgiveness of of sins. Now, this homily of Pope St. John Paul II, though over 20 years old, is still profoundly, tremendously important for us today. We cannot forget the inherent message that Pope St. John Paul II was essentially saying, that Christ himself embodies the Father's merciful love for all people, expressed on the cross. Personally, for myself, I can also see this in one of my favorite quotes from a Robert Frost poem. It says, My heart can think of no greater devotion than to be the shore to the ocean. Now, I like that very much because it makes the shore it shows something about the shore that we don't quite often see, right? The shore, when the ocean is covering it, is the ocean bottom. But when the tide comes in and goes out and comes in and goes out, the shore appears to extend itself. As the tide goes out, as it retreats, and as the tide comes in, it, extend, it, it retracts itself and continues throughout all of it to uphold the ocean. And that's what the Father's love, I think, St. John Paul II, and what our Lord Jesus Christ is essentially, is essentially saying about the Lord's forgiveness. That he extends himself to meet us where we are. The Father, in this parable, ran to the Son and embraced him. And then he went out of the party to his other son who wouldn't forgive his brother. The Father is like the shore that extends itself to the turbulent, tumultuous, terrible ocean that comes in and goes out and is representative of all our own peculiar behaviors, quixotic, temperamental behaviors that come in and go out and are so erratic all the time. God extends himself to us. And so that's what we have to think about today is, how is the Father extending himself? How is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit extending the love of the the divine trinity to us at all times? How is the Father extending himself to you right now? Thank you very much for listening to this reflection on today's gospel. 
If you like this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. God bless you.